Hello and welcome to this episode of Truthverse. I'm Brendan D. Murphy and this week on Healthy Life Radio, we are joined by Tom Barnett, a fellow Australian, also in the Northern Rivers area of the land of Oz, Australia Traz, as some call it. Tom, thanks for being here, mate, for a chat. Hey, Brendan. Thanks, mate. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Firstly, I guess for those who may not know you, let's just go for a quick bit of background. Tom Barnett, who is Tom Barnett? How did he end up being in, a, in this crazy sort of global movement, this freedom movement, this health movement. Give us a backstory. Yeah, well, it was just because I put a video out in uh, end of April and it was titled, Can You Catch a Virus? And then it went around the whole world and no one knew me before then, mostly because I keep my mouth shut, but <laughs> it was just one of those times where things were getting so stupid that I had to say something and ended up being picked up, which was good. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, it went viral. So that was your foray into this whole world. Am I remembering this incorrectly? Were you involved in one of the alternative political parties at some point not long ago? Yeah, I was part of the IMOP in the last federal election. Okay. And yeah, that went well. Politics isn't my thing, but when people need somebody to speak for them, I'm always happy to do it. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's where we're at right now. We need the average person to step up and be one of those people because obviously we can't rely on politicians who are there they clearly don't work for us how do you feel about the state of play at, at this point yeah it's nothing to even talk about it's, the thing is i think when people actually want to do that sort of thing they probably shouldn't i think it should always be given to people who are elected by the people to speak for them yeah. i usually find that if you're at a gathering for example and whoever wants to speak and wants to be heard and say their thing and whatever they're probably the ones that should sit down and the ones that are sitting there that are asked to speak, they're generally the ones that should speak. And I think that's how politics would work. If it worked, then that's the way it would work because it would be your peers saying, Brendan, I've just known him for a long time and I know he's got some good stuff. Brendan, can you please speak? As opposed to you getting up and going, oi, you listen to me, I've got something to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. That's the premise of politics in theory. that They're supposed to be our representatives and talk on our behalf. Yeah. But yeah, obviously that system has failed us quite miserably. So are you retaining any affiliation with IMOP? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't do anything for it at all. Like I'm not uh, an active, there's nothing to do really. When there's an election, if they need me to run for the House of Representatives again, then I will. I think the guys in Queensland are more active all of the time and it's good that they do that because it is an awareness thing, but I don't really have a strong kind of presence in any one particular field. Like I do so much work in so many different fields that unless I was going to get paid for it, I'm not just going to put all my effort into one particular area like vaccinations or fluoride in the water or whatever, just because I think from what I do, that would be uh, limiting what I can do. Yeah, I know exactly how you feel. And I also agree with your take on the psychology of the people being involved in politics as well. I think actually you took the words right out of my mouth. The people who should be in there are the ones who really would rather not be in there. They should be pushed forward by the, their community who actually knows them as, as a voice for the community rather than the guy yeah. who, who wants to be the showboat or the show pony going, hey, look at me, aren't I special? Um, totally yeah. on the same page there. Recently, there was a 5G rally that you mentioned. Yeah. Tell us what's going on there. Yeah, so we're trying to move away from the words rallies and protests and things like that because in a legal sense, if you're protesting, you're begging. It's like you're begging for something to happen. And I've never been a fan of rallies and protests. Maybe it's because I'm just naturally introverted and things anyway, but I don't like going out, clanging saucepans together and yelling at the sky because it really doesn't do anything. It does something when it's, let's say there's a company coming in and they want to bulldoze somebody's house or bulldoze a tree that's special to the neighborhood. That's when protesting can work. Stand in front of the bulldozers, shout at the sky, clang your saucepan, stamp on the ground. That has an effect because it can stop that. But when you're dealing with a government or massive telcos and things like that, sure, it's got its place. I'm not saying don't go out and do it. But I just think, especially now, where they've progressively been trying to make protests illegal and things like that, well, you can't do it. Now you can't gather because of COVID and all these other things. You've got to be really intelligent about the way you do things. Otherwise, you're just going to make it worse. And so that's why I stay away from these things because it's usually people who are very emotional about something but have not got the intellect to be able to intelligently put something together that has a plan of action and then a desired result at the end. It's usually just shout at something and hope for the best. And it doesn't work in what we're looking at now. It's a different world. We're not standing in front of bulldozers. We're standing in front of an entire new world order regime. So we need to be a lot more intelligent about it and a lot more... Uh, tactical. We really need to be tactical. So what we did is uh, we 
the police knew we were coming and we made it very clear that it was going to be a very peaceful event and it was literally just to stand for what we want. And so we still spoke. I spoke and a few others spoke and nobody was trying to rev the crowd up. We were speaking very much on point to what's going on and the realities of things and why this is important. And then we walked and we had Jambi, who's a local Indigenous guy, and he did a grounding meditation before we walked. And then he walked at the front with his clapping sticks and then everyone basically walked in silence. And it was supremely powerful. And when we got to the site where the telco tower is meant to go, the guy whose site it is was so surprised to see this many people who didn't want it there and who were behaving the way we were. We weren't being raving lunatics or anything. And so we now have a result at the end, which is I was speaking personally directly to the police commander who was there and the police liaison lady who was there. And we had a really good day. They're happy for a lot of things to continue in the future the way we did it. And so it was a really positive result and a positive result in that the guy who is agreeing to have the 5G tower put in his industrial lot is now wanting to talk to us, at least open a conversation. So overall, it was really good. And everybody came away winning from that. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. That sounds like progress being made there. Yeah. Unreal. And I, I like you, you mentioned the languaging earlier. You spoke about that. My comprehension is, like you're saying, we need to be careful with the wording we use for things. I interviewed Chris James earlier and he was talking about we always have the right as men and women for, to peacefully gather. We can gather wherever we want, whenever we want. Peaceful gatherings can't be legislated against. All that statute stuff doesn't apply to the living men and women mm -hmm. unless they consent to it. So, I, yeah. I, I think that's part of this intelligent strategy of going forward in a way that we, we don't get entangled in their manipulative system and give them jurisdiction accidentally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm, after we did the Freedom Day rally, I just made it pretty clear that we need tactics for that because you can't put people who are essentially amateurs into a professional ring and expect them to perform. And they can do themselves more harm because they might know that statutes don't apply to men and women but when they don't have the faculties to be able to implement that properly then you get emotional you start yelling or you start raising your voice or your energy comes up and then you just bring the police around you and the situation around you and you create something that doesn't need to be created you create something that you didn't want and so what it comes down to is having the power to create what we do want and that comes from a place of stillness not from a place of uh, chaotic irrationality and so it's really important to, but it's like anything, that's a skill, Brendan. You can't just learn this law stuff and then just go out to a rally and implement it. Because as soon as you're face to face with a police officer, that's different to practicing in the mirror. You can practice anything you want, practice piano in your living room all day. Then you get on stage with everyone watching. It's a different thing. And it's the same thing. Implementing your law stuff in the heat of the battle is completely different. And you need to realize it takes some experience to do that. And until we have the majority of people knowing how to do that, it doesn't matter. So that's why I was really happy for the police to be there and to get on side with them because everyone there, hopefully by now, knows that everything they're talking about, the Health and Safety Act or whatever, where you've got to be 20 people and one and a half metres apart, all that kind of crap, everyone knows that's bull crap and that it doesn't apply to men and women, but that's useless information. So at the moment, people are much better off adhering to some of their rules and wishes and being on side with the police, because if you don't know how to implement that properly, as soon as you get the police offside, you're losing. Yep. You're not going to win against the police with guns and more numbers than you and all that sort of stuff. And we want them on our side because essentially they live in the same town. That's what they were saying to us as well. They're going, look, we just want you guys to do it the right way because we live in this town too. And I think people forget that. They see the police and they're like, oh, that's the opposition. That's the new world order. But it's not. These are people that have kids and grow up in this area as well. And hey, maybe they don't know what we know. And yeah, maybe some of them are assholes and they just want to find people and raise revenue. But at the end of the day, not all of them are like that. So I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we just say F the police and F this and F that without trying to at least include them where they can work with us and not against us. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good reminder that they are ultimately men and women who are wearing those blue costumes and and men and women have fears and they have insecurities and they have vulnerabilities and all this sort of stuff. They have families, like you're saying. Ultimately, they're not going to benefit from the kind of world that the New World Order is building. They're also the ones who are employed, literally employed to roll it out. So we do need them on site. At the end of the day, the order followers are the ones we need on site. It's crucial. It's, it's a matter of urgency that they start to come over to, to our side and start understanding what's really going on. And mm -hmm. if we're ranting and screaming at them, then we undermine that process. Yeah.
Absolutely. And it's all part of the same thing. We can't create enemies. And sure, I fully agree that some of them deserve to lose their jobs because of the way they act. And I fully agree that it's a foreign occupying force. It's a foreign corporation. They only serve a master that wants no good for us. But at the end of the day, there's still the potential for the ones that are on the ground that we deal with day to day to actually make some difference. And if they don't, then we take the other side. But I, I think we've always got to give people a chance and to try to do things as peacefully as possible. Mm. And then in the back of our minds behind us, we've, we've got the guns, so to speak. We're ready to use them if need be, but that's not the first port of call, which is where some people go to combating straight away as opposed to being a bit more tactical, which I think is a better way to go. Yeah, for sure. And I, I guess partly that comes from understanding the law and what our rights really are and how that dynamic yeah. works. Because yeah. if you don't know that you've got all this power and all these rights, then you're pretty much just left there going, all I can do is scream at these people kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And so that's where some people are. So we understand that, but that's why we're encouraging people to also get an understanding of why they may feel reactive and the need to have an outburst so we can work on that and yeah, rein it in a little just at this point in time. But that's why I just think it was so important to relay how well that rally went because everybody won. The people who we were really protesting against want to talk to us. Everybody that was there had a good time, got what we needed to do done and nothing bad happened. And the police had a good time. They liked us and they are supportive of what we're doing in the future as long as we're you know open with them. And so... Like I say, it was a win-win all around. Yeah, beautiful. Absolutely. So how do you see this victory with the 5G tower in the Northern Rivers area? What's your take on the bigger picture of the 5G rollout and how this fits into the, the even bigger picture? How do you see all that? It's not a win yet. It's just that we're going in the right direction. Mm. But what I see it being is a precedent for other people. The problem with that is are there enough people in other areas to want to follow that precedent? Because there are, obviously... A lot of people who we don't think they're there because we interact with each other and are like, why would you want that? But you go to somewhere else and they're like, yeah, why wouldn't you want that? And they're actually the majority in a lot of cases. So they're asking for it. And when I spoke at the rally, the first thing I did was acknowledge and thank the police and just put everyone in the right mind frame about they're not the enemy. And then I also talked about responsibility where... There is a big responsibility for us at an individual level because the telco services offer a service. Banks offer services. It's us that take out credit cards, personal loans and mortgages for things we don't need and support the pedophilic rings, the wars, the everything else, because we take out the the loans. They just offer it. They're not inherently evil. If we didn't take those services, there wouldn't be the pedophile rings, the corrupt systems that we live under, the wars and all that sort of stuff. We create it. Individually, we create it with the choices that we make. Mm. So until we can be less like data greedy and everything else and get off devices and all that kind of thing, they're literally just offering a service. So it's up to us individuals to be like, hey, look, that's not necessary. And then there's less of a demand, then there's less of this push for all this. We know where it's going. We know it's more about social control a moneyless system and social credits and monitoring everything and being able to control everything that you do. And then, yeah, they can turn up signals strength whenever they want to make people unhealthy, all that kind of stuff. We know about that agenda. And I guess that's what you're asking is where is that going? But what I always see is that nature's a self-regulating system. So while there's pressure being put on us from this side, things move on this side. Things don't just get pressurized and then there's nothing. So people are moving now. People are becoming more proactive in securing food, growing food and food availability and production, becoming more self-sufficient in skills and becoming more off grid, all that kind of thing, which is pushing people where they wanted to go in the first place, which has been more connected to nature. It's, this is trying to take nature away. So then the other side is we're getting more and more connected to nature. So I think overall, there's going to be some positives mm. that come from it. And really, I think the biggest positive is where people are actually being very tuned in now to what they definitely want with their lives because they're now aware of what they definitely do not want with their lives. Yeah. And until the pressure's on, people just don't know. They just float around. Yeah, I'll just do a bit of that. Yeah, I'll just go here. Yeah, I'll just go there. You know, they're not really sure. And now people are becoming, hey, no, 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 that's not it. I definitely don't want that. I definitely want to be closer to nature. I definitely want this. I definitely want that. So I see it as a real positive. I think it's quite an exciting time to have people become really tuned in to themselves more so than they were in the past. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a really good point, actually. The, this situation, this shutdown, this orchestrated scam has, has shown people, it's actually encouraged them to question the way that they're living their lives because a lot of people just go through the motions. They're on autopilot as they've been programmed by the system, going through the education system, the news media and all this, and that worldview that it builds people into. And then all of a sudden they can't go to work anymore. And they're like, well, how much did I actually really like that job? Was yeah. I destroying my soul there? Or you know, questions that a lot of people... Like you and I probably think, oh, these are really obvious elementary things to consider. It turns out that a lot of people haven't actually asked themselves what they really want to experience. Yeah, absolutely. And when I work with clients, you might do the same. Like one of the fundamental questions is what their dream is in life, because if they don't really know what they want to do with it, it's really hard to stick to rehabilitative exercises or a certain diet or whatever. But when they've got, this is what I'm doing it for, it becomes easy. The motivation, the discipline are just there. I think one of the things that, I find the most interesting, what I've liked the most about what we're seeing, and if it gets worse, the reason I'll like it even more, I don't think people know what to do with freedom. I think a lot of people want it, but they don't know what to do with it. So the analogy is that if all the money in the world was spread out evenly within a short amount of time, those that were rich would be rich again, and those that were poor would be poor again because of what's going on between the ears. It's the way people relate to themselves and money and whatever else in that analogy. And so if freedom was just blanket given to everybody throughout the world. I don't think enough people are yet adult enough to know what to do with that. So within a short amount of time, there would be new power structures and they would just be under the regime of somebody else telling them what to think and what to do because they don't yet know how to think for themselves, how to act for themselves and how to take responsibility for themselves. So just like children, these children in adult bodies are just going to end up with a new power structure. So I don't think people know what to do with freedom yet. Like I don't have a lot of faith in people as such in their comfortability, the ego. But what I do have immense faith in is the indomitability of the human spirit. It's what happens when you see a natural disaster or whatever. You see what people are capable of. And the human spirit to me is just phenomenal. And I have inherent, unquestionable faith in that. So I think it needs to get to a worse place before we see the human spirit really come and to show even the person who's embodied by that spirit what it's actually capable of because these people who I think don't know what to do with freedom, I just don't think they know what they're capable of yet. So I'm hoping in some way for an apocalyptic um, <laughs> thing to happen so that people see it and they realize the strength of their own human spirit so that they can then start doing something with it. Yeah, I said, and I, I actually really can empathize with that point of view. Tom, I think we we're going to talk about masculinity. Let's go there because we haven't had that discussion for the listeners yet on the show. Cool. All right. Yeah, it's come up a few times in the uh, Q&As that I've done and just in conversation in general. So it seems like a big topic because there's a bit of confusion about what it means in general and what it means and the role that it plays today. And one of the things that I think that you and I know that's a societal engineering thing, but what we see with a lot of the problems in the world, it's essentially there's a real lack of the feminine quality in the world and it's what's led to the way things have gone the way the world is run is a very overly masculine way but not in a powerful way it's the weak kind of masculinity that is just very domineering and destructive and so it makes sense that there's a lot of women are speaking up and when you see the people at the front of rallies and things it's a lot of women and it makes sense because it is the feminine that's going to heal the world but i think there's a bit of confusion about the role of masculinity and how it still has a huge role to play in the recovery of what we're, we're going through. Yeah, like you're saying, the, the masculine that has led us to where we are historically has been the shadow side of the masculine. It's been the tyrant, the dictator, that kind of thing. So what is the healthy side of the masculine that you're seeing emerge now? Is, is that what you're witnessing? Some of it, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of confusion still because we're taught in our society to suppress the masculine from an early age. And so therefore, when you suppress something, that's where you create shadow emotions and shadow personas and things. And then that's where you get things come out and lash out on, on the other side because it's suppressed. It comes around in a different way. The more powerful way, the way I've described it, not saying I'm right, is that essentially a big part of it, it's a power. It's the ability to basically scorch the earth with the power that you have, but true masculinity has enough around it to temper it. So you have the ability to do that, but it's tempered, it's contained. And if it needs to be let out in certain ways, it's in a very controlled way. So it has a real power to it. And it's always a giving power. And so there's a lot of guys that are really confused about that. The guys are taught to hide their sexuality, for example, that it's offensive and that you don't show certain 
the way you deal with women, for example, like guys are really suppressed, as are women, but men are really taught to hide their masculinity. And in a lot of ways, taught that anger and aggression are wrong. And so then when it's suppressed to the point where it's not channeled properly, it comes out in the unhealthy ways. So we see a lot of destruction in society and the way the world's currently run. And I think it's from the suppression of the masculinity. And like you said, that's creating the shadow versions, which are inherently destructive. And same with women too. A lot of the feminism movement, it's like bringing men down, but then a lot of them are going after the epitome of the male ego, the finances, the jobs, the power, this, that, and the other. That is the epitome of the balls part of the male ego. That's what's wrong with things. Why are you going after that? So you're seeing a lot of imbalance all throughout the spectrum. And I don't know yeah, really what the main answers are, but I know that's one of the problems. So being aware of it, I think is a good start. Yeah. Is there anything that you've seen that you want to pick up on in that regard? I've always valued the idea of personal development, like shadow work and this kind of thing. What about the journey that you've gone? Have you undertaken this in an intentional way to work on yourself so that you're working through your shadow content and that kind of stuff? Yeah, but that's a lot of work and a lot of people aren't willing to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I speak to a lot of girls who keep who are very aware and they just keep saying, I meet a lot of guys and I like them, but they're just not willing to go through it. And yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah they're totally. not. So yeah, the solutions are readily available and they're there. Absolutely. And a lot of them are really simple, but for the individual, they're not really easy. And we're brought up in this world to value ease and convenience because we're taught we can have everything easily and conveniently. It's always been the case that it takes a lot of work. You want to master a guitar. There you go. That's seven years worth of a lot of work before you're going to get proficient enough to be really good to move somebody with that instrument. That's it's going to take time. You can't just go, yeah, I'll do a few lessons off YouTube. In three months, I'll just be like a lady killer on the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. And any skill, being a health practitioner, it takes a long time. You can't just do your course for three months, hand over a few thousand dollars, and now you're competent because you got your name on a certificate. You have to go through a lot of not knowing before you can know. And then the same thing applies to your personal development. It's years worth of work. And you're going to face some of the things that are part of the shadow and the ego that the ego literally cannot handle. You would rather die than face some of these sides of yourself. So it's actually easier to go through and suck at guitar for a few years, learn a language or do whatever it takes to do your 10,000 hours in something else. Because most of the time you don't have to face that part of yourself that is literally unbearable to face. And until you face that unbearable side, I don't think you're getting through to the core of your being and therefore getting closer to God and being able to embody completely the masculinity if you're a man uh, or the femininity if you're a woman, but also obviously being able to coalesce both sides within yourself, whether you're a man or a woman. Yeah. And so that's where you'll come across somebody and there's something about the resonance of their being that both at the same time, you feel instantly comfortable and calm with them and around them, but you also know not to put a foot wrong because they could scorch you in a second because they're embodying things very to the core. No, and it's not going to come out in a destructive or an unconscious way. And that's where you'll find the balance. It's pretty rare. I don't know. What do you think? Have you met many people like that? I, th I think that is actually quite rare. And, and as you're saying, the one thing that we don't get to have with ease and convenience is a true self or a real self. We can have just about anything else more easily than that one thing. And that one thing opens the door to the divinity. It's kind of like the shadow work thing is going through the unconscious and going into the unconscious and dealing with that that crap that's in there and the yeah. stuff that we'd rather not, that, that makes us so uncomfortable and oh, I don't want to see that about myself and I don't want to see that about myself. So I'm just going to gloss over it and I'm going to justify it. I'm going to justify my ego, my bull crap, and I'm going to try and not swear here for the show. And so we build all this armory and this armory is, is what we then identify as the self. And that's the synthetic self. That's your ego self. And you're yeah. shielding in the process. You're building like this tank-like armor around yourself, which disconnects you from other people. And in the process, disconnects you from the deeper, truer aspects of yourself and something bigger than you, which is the eternity, the eternal, the infinite. Yeah, I said, absolutely. And the other thing that it does is not only... Uh, builds a wall and protects itself, but it actually becomes something else and it becomes a spiritual person. And then it has 500,000 followers on Instagram and does cacao ceremonies and does uh, consults on living your best life and being your spiritual self. And it's hiding. It's just a projection of what it wants to be, but it hasn't actually reached it yet. Those yeah. that have it generally don't talk about it. it so there's a lot of levels in which that operates and it's easy to see when you can see it, but until then you have no, you can't tell what's what. 
Yeah, well said. And the ego is a self-perpetuating thing. Any thought form that you create wants to survive. And so it needs energy. And so it tries to create and harvest energy to survive. And then it multiplies and it grows. And it's what you're describing with the egoic construct there. When I look around at the, the truth movement, it's like the rest of society in a lot of ways. It's people who haven't done the shadow work. It's people who haven't gone into themselves and, and really taken a good, long, hard look in the mirror and seen it warts and all. And I know that there are some great people with good intentions. And I see some of them. I know some of them are friends with some of them. And they're these man children. They like, have all these big ideas, but they haven't landed on the earth and grounded themselves into their personal reality because they're too busy projecting how they want things to be and this image that they want to be perceived as. Is that something you've consciously worked against or tried to deal with in your own life? Yeah, absolutely. When I was younger, in my early 20s, I wanted to write a book and tell everybody what I knew and all this sort of stuff. I actually heard a quote from a guy in his 70s and he says, the world needs books, doesn't necessarily need your book. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's true. How much of me just wants to be heard or wants to tell people how it is and how much of me is just resonating calmly in the background and just offering something that people actually need or want to hear or whatever. And so I went on a journey of not really speaking at all and, and making sure that I could, first of all, understand where what I was speaking was coming from and then also how relevant or necessary it actually was. And then every time I went to open my mouth for a long time, I was like, you know what? I want to say that. It's not that other people want to hear it. And so, yeah, that's where I came to that. And I spent a lot of time by myself and uh, a lot of time just, you know, camping out in the bushes by myself and not living in houses and not using money and doing all that sort of stuff, not having a girlfriend, all those kinds of things. And it really made a big difference because these days I operate very calmly in the world. Like I'm very content, even with not many things. I've got a drum kit now and some guitars, but like for a long time, I haven't had anything. And these things bring me a lot of joy, but I would also be just as content without them. And I think the way you put it just before, Brendan, was really good because I think that masculinity, when it's really embodied, is very grounding. I think that's where it could be described really well. It's very rooted to the earth and it's very grounded. And I do see a lot of guys that don't have that at the moment. They're very wanting to project like you were talking about, but also need to jump out of their skin almost and do things. And the masculinity does want to give and put out like that, but the, the true essence of it isn't that flighty at all. It's not reactive. It's very resonant and very grounding and very solid. So mm -hmm. that's what I've seen anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's also true of the real authentic kind of feminine principle as well. Two sides of the same coin there. And anyone I know who is really authentic in themselves has that presence that rock solid presence like they weigh a thousand tons they're so anchored to the spot and it's you can feel it radiating from someone when they're comfortable in their own skin and a lot of people aren't comfortable in their own skin and i think that's a lot of what that journey is to just get there if you can get there you've done probably a large amount of the work yeah for sure absolutely i used to actually think that it was about doing all the shadow work but then i figured it was just growing a beard that's all it took <laughs> <laughs> so that was all we had to do. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Got to save some hassles. Yeah. No, so, you're right. It is, it's the same on both sides. But I think the reason that it's the same on both sides is that somebody who is really grounded, they do have balance the masculine and the feminine in themselves. That's what gives that rooted feeling. So I think, like you said, they weigh a thousand tons. And I think that's part of why a man or a woman has that same quality. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen, I'm sure you've noticed, the, the sort of communist deconstruction of Western civilization, specifically attacking things that are actually useful and, and good, because obviously we can criticize the West to no end. But that communist sort of thing coming out of the Frankfurt School and all this stuff, where we get the sort of fourth and third waves of feminism and this really anti-social destructive stuff. I'm not sure where I was going with that now, but what I'm getting at is we've had this manufactured war and distortion of what feminism looks like and this distortion of what masculinity looks like and talk of toxic masculinity and this yeah. kind of nonsense which is all divide and conquer and get to get us fighting amongst ourselves have you noticed this kind of thing yeah yeah hugely and it is exactly that it's engineered it's designed to divide and conquer and it's designed to confuse but it can only confuse i don't like saying the weak mind but it's a mind that hasn't really developed in itself yet has the potential to be very strong and very resonant but just hasn't developed yet and so this is that whole children and adult body analogy which is most people around 12 years of age most adults i see around 12 years of age haven't yeah, developed right. in a lot of ways and so then it's very easy to 
It's like you imagine a group of eight to 12 year olds at a party and how you can easily control if you throw something, throw an idea or throw a bit of a whatever. It's very easy to just light a fire. And that's the same in society because people haven't really quite grown through that yet. Mm. Yeah. So that's just how it is. But it does make it quite, I think when we've gone through more of that ourselves, it's very easy to sit here and laugh at them or criticize and judge and whatever. But I think it's a lot more important to hold a little bit of, like you would with a kid who doesn't really know any better, is to hold a bit of empathy and to, to at least offer a way without patronizing or making them feel bad, just to offer different ways and hopefully inspire by the way that we carry ourselves and without having to tell them. Mm, yeah. I think that's kind of important because it's so easy and I'm guilty of it. I laugh at things all the time. Because I happen to think I'm funny, even though I'm probably not. And I like to I like to joke about everything, and I like to use sarcasm and things. And really, that's an avoidance mechanism in a lot of ways as well. That's something that I'm aware of, and I still have a tendency to go towards as my first way of dealing with something. But at the end of the day, I'm trying not to be as critical of others. It's just so easy to laugh at people. It's like the comedy writes itself with some of what goes on in society. Like Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians because the way he attacks things like feminism and like women in general, even though he obviously loves women, but some of the things that go on, but then also the way men behave and the way politics works and the way people are just overly sensitive about everything. He does it so well. Mm. And it's so good because he's just hitting without holding back. He's really hitting the core of the truth of everything. And that's what makes it funny. But at the same time, I'm like for myself, I'm trying not to just let it be a comedy show. I'm trying to be a little bit more offering some solution as opposed to just laughing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an understandable thing when you're surrounded with the kind of insanity that we're dealing with now, which is off the charts. As someone who is not part of that hive mind, you've got to have coping strategies. Yeah. Just get by it. Find the humor in it. Whether you're making a joke about it or whether you're just tuning it out, it's one way or another, we've got to survive the onslaught of absolute madness. I have no judgments about someone having a bit of a, a dig sarcastically or making jokes here and there. I don't go out of my way to put people down or make them feel bad. But if someone attacks yeah. me and comes at me, then I'm happy to play the role of the trickster and undermine that and, and, and poke fun at them using their own words kind of thing there's something to that <laughs> yeah especially if they're trolls or whatever and they're yeah. like writing stuff it's just so easy i'm not going to stop doing it but i just mean in general mm. the energy that i'm putting out i'm happy to do that to trolls and that's no problem but when the energy that i'm putting out sometimes i think i'm laughing at people and calling retards i have heard a lot of movie clips and one of my favorite movie lines is you never go full retard the um, <laughs> yeah. tropic thunder and it's just so on point and even that it's funny but I'm wondering if I should be putting out into the world, calling people retards for washing their hands furiously and smothering their face with masks. I still find it funny. But. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sometimes that's all it's about, just having a laugh. And we can't control people's reactions to every little thing. And, and we also know that we're not going to reach everybody either. That's we're right. never going to get through to a lot of people. They're going to be triggered. It's just sometimes the chips will fall where they will. We wanted to talk a bit about the role of what some people might call the NPC characters or the non-player characters, the human beings in their own right, who are just not getting it and never going to get it, but they have their place in the grand scheme of things, right? Yeah, they do. A lot of people talk to me about it all the time. They find it really frustrating and sometimes depressing that there's so many people in the world that they call NPCs or Karens or just people that just don't get it and they're never going to. And you can get a lot of comfort when you realize that they aren't actually going to because the world needs everybody. The world needs the people that are really lazy and don't feel like working as much as they need the people that are really giving it their all. Because without them, we don't exist either. So the world actually needs every character in this story that's being played out. Otherwise, we just don't have it. It's not reality anymore. So that's why people like us, Brendan, we're okay with things like that because we get the greater picture. When I'm like, why won't they wake up? Why are these people doing that? Why are they still doing? Because it's just a part of it. And it's important to actually celebrate them. And if you do that, you be lazy because we need you. And you wear those masks because we need you to do that. It is really a part of the grand narrative or the grand illusion. It's all part of it. And it's a big part of it. And it's just meant to be. And knowing that it's meant to be, it's like that whole thing of if you think that it should be daytime all the day and that's enlightenment. And as soon as it's night for 12 hours of the day, you're really pissed off and you're depressed because you think that it should be sunny. But nature has all things. Mm. And so yeah. if we can be okay with that, then we can be okay with the fact that there are these people who just aren't going to get it ever. And then you also don't have to waste your energy trying to make them wake up. It's yeah. If you are, if somebody comes across somebody like you, Brendan, you're calm and you're happy, then there should just be something about you that's like, I don't feel as angry or as 
lost or unsure when I'm around you. There's something about you. You shouldn't have to tell me the world does this and the pedos run this and this runs that. You shouldn't have to say it because there's an element that I can just get from you, what you resonate. And that makes me feel good. We don't really need to go telling these people to wake up and trying to hit them over the head. But if they ask, obviously we can give information or if they want to know, we'll tell. And if they want to be around us, they will. But if they don't want it, cool. Exactly. And that's just the, the divine tapestry playing out. We've got to have the, the mask wearers because they are having their own learning experience while we're having our learning experience and they are creating that mutual experience with us. And that tension of opposites is helping us all to reach, whether it's intentionally and consciously or unintentionally and unconsciously, realizations. Ultimately, the mystical, spiritual view of things, we're all going up the mountain and finding our own different paths to the same destination. And we're not all going to arrive at the same time. A lot of people are simply going to hang around at the base of the mountain for a while because they're afraid of heights or whatever. And mm-hmm. that's fine because that helps the rest of the, the fractal do its thing and move in its ways and allow all of us to play off of each other. If we were all the same, if we were all homogenous, it would be quite a miserable affair, I think. Yeah, unless it was me and you, then it'd be awesome. <laughs> if everyone was just like us, we'd be set. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But we do need everybody around also to test us because they're a barometer. People go, oh, I'm so awake and I'm so aware and I'm so this. And it's, yeah, but if you're reactive to somebody that's not, then are you really? Yeah. Because if you're a monk sitting on top of a mountain, you're celibate and you think you've mastered your sexuality or your masculinity or your whatever, how can you know that without a woman to test you? Mm. And how can you know that you're calm and resonant if you can't stand in front of police at a protest or something? Because if you can't do that, you don't know. And more than likely, you can't do that if you're not being tested. So we need these complementary opposites to know whether we know ourselves. It's like a barometer. It doesn't really matter what's happening out there. All the experiences happen inside of us. And so we need that to have the experience and to know where we are. Without it, we can never be sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's helping us to figure out what's real for us, what's true for us, and, and to grow in directions that we otherwise wouldn't be able to grow because there are some things you just can't do without being tested. You can't learn to ride a bike unless you fall off it and you go through the pain of, of the learning process and you become transformed on the other side of that. You're not the same dude who started out. Yeah, that's it. And that's where the growth is. It's always about where we're growing. And so that's why I value I like being uncomfortable. If I'm in a house for a couple of years and I start going, this is pretty cozy, I'll go out and I'll camp in a tent for a while. I'll make myself uncomfortable because I know I'm not growing if I'm at least experiencing some degree of uncomfortability. So I like pushing myself through. Like recently I started doing pole dancing classes because I'm like, what would be the most uncomfortable thing? It's being the only guy in a room full of beautiful women and sucking at something and doing something that's really not me at all. That's hard. If I can do that and not die, I'm, I, then I'm pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's ballsy. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm always like looking for something that's going to uh, make me uncomfortable and challenge myself. Yeah. That's just what I want. Other people don't have to do that, but I value the uncomfortability because it's only the ego that gets really comfortable. So I'm always trying to challenge it so that I can be more connected to myself more than anything. Yeah, yeah. And there's a growth factor that comes out of that. The dude who comes out the other side of of the pole dancing classes is going to be a different Tom to the dude who went in there and was like, oh, fuck, I'm uncomfortable. This is awful. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just not being scared to participate because a lot of people don't participate in life. They take the easy road. People might think this, so I won't do it. Or no, that might be difficult, so I won't do it. They're not participating. You have to actively choose to participate in life. We chose to come here in the first place, consciousness needing to choose something to be conscious of. We chose this life that we came into, but while we're here, it's not a free ride. We continually, in every moment, have to choose to participate in living life. And if we're not, by default, we're choosing not to live. And that's the where the matrix is. You're either in that little thing getting the energy sucked out of you or you're actually choosing to participate in life, whatever that is. And so that's why I just like to remind myself every day to make that choice. Yeah, exactly. I think you articulated that really well. We are here on some level, there was some intentionality or choice to it. And we're here to be here and not to pretend that we're not here. The being here and really embracing that and and getting your fingers dirty, so to speak, is where the the magic and the alchemy is because that's how we become the next best or the next most evolved or enlightened version of ourselves, the next most uh, robust and and secure and confident version of of yourself. And that unflappable dude who weighs a thousand tons and the embracing of Tom Barnett, even knowing that you're a bigger consciousness than the Tom Barnett mind, but that larger consciousness having the experience of 
Tom Barnett in this life. So it's your responsibility to embrace being Tom Barnett to the fullest and, and explore that. And, and it's so convenient and easy not to. It's so convenient to just go on Instagram for a couple of hours or to just go hang out with friends, just to go drink or not really participate. It's really easy not to, really easy and really convenient. And so that's why if something becomes convenient, I'll stop doing it. I'll make myself do the work, which we always used to. That's why you never saw Indigenous folk that had the same problems that we have because they're was, they was always participating. And now Western culture went and took all that away and took the wisdom that was with it away with it. Yeah. So uh, I'm always trying to get that back as much as possible. Yeah, beautiful. I like that. Tom, it's the hot minute. Take us home. What do you want people to hear or take away? How do they follow you? All that kind of stuff. What's your message if you have one for people? Sure. My message is always the same. It's just to come back to who you are. You've got to really be connected with yourself, with the earth, with the heavens. If you're connected, you're basically not going to get it wrong. You're not going to be unsure or lost or, or anything like that because you're always living in the given moment. And like we we're talking about earlier, you're always choosing to live, choosing to participate. So then it doesn't matter if your life only lasts for five more seconds, you're living in an eternity already. But you could live a 120 year life and, and never actually fully live it or ever be alive because you're just following the status quo or dogma or whatever and, and too scared to actually live. Always come back to yourself and I think you'll be fine. Where you can follow me is Instagram. My photography is barnett.media and this kind of stuff is on tombarnett.tv. And tombarnett.tv is the website that's almost online. It's already up and you can go on the mailing list. If you go there, you can sign up and then we'll be live in around a week, maybe two. Beautiful. Awesome. Great. I love how you brought that home. Very succinct. And many words of wisdom there for people to uh, ponder on and, and digest. Tom, it's been great having you, man. I've really enjoyed this discussion. It was a breath of fresh air. Thanks for your time, man. I look forward to doing it again someday. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Brandon. Awesome, bro. I've experienced censorship on no less than four different platforms so far, so if you'd like to help me get my work past the censors, please do subscribe and share it around for me. And also remember to join me on truth.network, which is the platform I created for our conscious community to connect and gather away from the censors after Facebook, Fedbook shut down our page in 2018. So head over there, create your free account at truth.network, it's T-R-O-O-T-H, and I'll see you inside. Take care.